Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. I'm Dylan Burroughs here with Joe Kerr at the Hope For Our Times Conference in Southern California. We've been enjoying some of the top prophecy speakers from across the nation, and we're excited to be with you here today with Barry Stagner. Welcome to the program, Barry. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you as well. Barry is the host of World News Briefing on his channel.com. He's an author, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Tustin, and speaker on nationally broadcast radio program, The Truth About God. And Joe, we're excited to be here with Barry today. Uh, I was just personally touched by the speech he gave or the sermon he just shared a little bit about as in the days of Noah. Tell us a little bit about your feedback as you watch that today. Oh, that's a great topic and a hot topic right now because it is one of the precursors, and you use that term in your message, that we're looking for Christ. We know he's coming back. The Bible promises that several places. When? And it always comes back to the when. And the days of Noah is one of the references that we have for that. Talk about that just a little bit. Well, it's kind of curious. Here we have a time frame that we know lasted nearly two millennia, and yet we have very, very limited information about it. The days between Noah and uh, all the way back to Adam. Uh, some would say that's some 15, 1600 years, others up to 1900 years. But the information is contained in just really a couple of chapters. And we're given very specific details about what led to the flood. And that was the thoughts and intents of man's heart was only evil continually, and that the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. So I think the, the point of that is we don't have to sort through a bunch of details. We know what the days of Noah were like just through these two descriptive phrases. So we can compare that to what we're living in today. We're in a world filled with corruption. We're inventors of evil things. The thoughts and intents of man's heart are evil constantly and continually. And I don't think we need to convince anybody that the world is full of violence. Yeah, so let's go to that passage for a moment. If you look at Matthew 24, starting in verse 37, we read, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. And then Jesus says, Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So we don't know the day, but we do know the signs. And you talk about that in your message today. Share a little bit about some of these signs that are already happening before our very eyes. Well, if we consider what's happening in the world today and looking at the things that other prophecies have described, we can get a pretty good barometer as to where we are in the prophetic scenario And, you know, just looking at those two very basic components of society, we can establish the fact that we are in the days before the Lord's going to return. Now, I think, and there are wonderful Bible scholars that would disagree, but I think because of the fact that Jesus mentioned in the days before the flood, there was kind of this indifference to the signs attitude taking place in the world. And he makes that very clear distinction where he moved the narrative outside of the tribulation period and started addressing things that would be happening prior to it. And as he gives those descriptions, he talks about the buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage. And they did not know until the day when uh, the Lord closed the door of the ark. And, you know, I think if we compare that to society, we see a huge indifference today And recognizing what Noah was doing, he's called a preacher of righteousness. So he wasn't just building a boat. And again, subject that might be debatable. But we know at that point in time, the heavens opened and the fountains of the deep uh, had opened as well. But prior to that, the earth was watered by the firmament that hovered over the earth, the cloud cover. So we could say for 120 years, Noah built a boat on a planet where where it had never rained on dry land. And during that 120 years, he preached righteousness. The response was, we don't care. We don't get it. Buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage. And we live in a season of history right now where there is an an indifference to the impending judgment that's obviously looming out there on the horizon. 
Right, that's a good way to put it. And one thing I enjoyed about your message as well, you talked about the significance of Israel in these days. So talk a little bit about that with us, if you would. Why is it important that Israel is back in its land, that Jerusalem is under the control of the Jews? How does that relate to this idea of being like in the days of Noah? Well, there are things that are clearly stated in Scripture, and there are other things that are implied or assumed. One, you know, we have very clear statements in Ezekiel 37 that there is a progression that's initiated with these dry bones, and the dry bones indicate a long uh, time of being exposed to the elements. In other words, the Jews will be out of the land for an extended period of time. And then we have a progression that's presented through the sinew coming back on, the bones rattling, coming back together, flesh being put put on them, which tells us that there was going to be a process that brought them back into the land. And we see the uh, initial alias or the returns of the Jews back to the land that started actually in about 1892 and then reached the progression to the point where there was actually a declaration of statehood. So we see that uh, initial progression that begins with the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And then we have an attachment of Ezekiel 38 and 39 following that, which gives us kind of a chronology, so to speak, that we can use to parallel with other scriptures of things happening in the world. There is so much focus on that part of the world. I think I'm not that old, but I remember almost every president, there's a picture of them and whoever was the leader of that area at the time, hugging, shaking hands, they solved the world problems in the Middle East. And of course, then the next president had to do the same thing. And all through history, it's an area where there's just constant turmoil going all the way back to Jacob and Esau. What's different today? Well, I think as far as uh, prophecy goes, the difference today is that the Jews are in possession of Jerusalem. We see movement uh, that is pushing the world towards this greater animosity that Zechariah records in Zechariah chapter 12. The whole world is going to be gathered against Jerusalem eventually during the tribulation. And some of the wonderful things that we've seen happening even with our own administration are actually igniting those things in other countries around the world and causing, you know, rather than a kind of a unified approach to the nation of Israel, it's polarizing the opinions that were already preset and established, you know, prior to that, where you've got, you know, certain overtures being made by uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain now coming out and making a statement that, hey, Israel has a right to exist and uh, we want to be friendly with them. And I think that one of the most important aspects of this in that scenario recorded in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is that there are nations that invade and there are nations that protest. There are nations that are clearly named. There are nations that are absent, that are ancient enemies of Israel. And if we think about what's happened since Israel's history began as a modern state, there was one nation, you know, it was hours after the declaration by David Ben-Gurion that they were indeed a nation state once again. And that evening, just hours after that declaration, Egypt led a coalition of Arab nations to invade Israel. And yet now we've got Egypt working in partnership in the Sinai, especially to combat ISIS. And they have a cooperative uh, relationship with Israel, which takes our minds back to the fact that Isaiah 19 says that the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and Israel are all going to be called my people by the Lord. They will share the same language. So here we've got recent and current history about animosity between Egypt and Israel, and yet in the same time span that all these other things are happening, since Israel has been born a nation once again, We have now a friendly relationship between Egypt and Israel, a friendly relationship between the Saudis, which curiously is the home and birthplace of Islam. And now they're cooperating with Israel as well, which other nations, you know, want their destruction, Iran and others leading the charge in that area. So it's an incredible time to be alive to watch the scripture jump off the page. Well, this is fascinating information. When we come back, we want to talk not just about Israel, but the role the church plays in these last days. So stick with us. We'll be right back with more on A View from the Wall. The I Am A Watchman ministry believes the rapture can happen at any time. Are your friends and loved ones spiritually prepared for the coming of the Lord? What will happen to those left behind? Because we're concerned, we've created a new resource called a Rapture Kit. 
Rapture kits are designed to help believers reach out to those lost before the rapture and provide spiritual and practical information for those not taken in the rapture. Rapture kits include a wealth of video and printed resources. Resources that explain what the rapture is, how to come to faith, how to share your faith, and resources to aid in understanding Bible prophecy, the events associated with the tribulation period, and how to live for the Lord. Please visit the rapturekid.org website for more information on this incredible new resource. God bless. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. This is Dylan Burroughs with Joe Kerr, and we've been talking with Barry Stagner. And as we talk today, we've gotten into this issue of Israel and the role it plays as we consider this issue of the Bible's teaching on Jesus returning in a time when it is as the days of Noah. We talked in our last segment about Israel and its importance in prophetic events, but now we want to talk a little bit about the church and the role it plays. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says in verse 3, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Uh, this is interesting because we're seeing this in our culture more and more today. Speak to this a little bit and why that's important for us as we talk about Bible prophecy. Well, if we consider, first of all, that they won't put up a sound doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. So they'll sit through teaching, they just won't sit through sound teaching. And this has you know, ramifications, obviously, in the church's worldview. And if they're taught instead of things that will challenge them, things that will change them, things that will transform them, they're going to hear things that satisfy them, things that allow them to basically have an understanding that they're okay in the condition that they're in. That's what the whole ear tickling thing is about. They're hearing things that they want to hear. It's okay. God is accepting of this particular behavior. God is accepting of your own moral code, your decision to do that which is right in your own eyes. And so those are things that are pleasing to the flesh, and that's really what they're seeking after. And uh, there's one other component of that uh, narrative there that is curious, and he says that they're going to turn aside to fables. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is obviously always specific in his verbiage. And a fable is different than a myth. A myth is something that's totally fabricated. Pegasus, the flying horse, or unicorns, or, you know, anything that is just a, the, the byproduct of man's imagination. But a fable is different because a fable incorporates true things with things that are false. And I always like to use the example of there was an old woman who lived in a shoe who had so many children, she didn't know what to do. And these are things that are real. There's such a thing as old women, such a thing as shoes, and there's such a thing as children. But there's no such thing as a woman who lived in a shoe with uh, too many children to care for. So that's what's being said. And what that translates into, Christian verbiage is used to say things that are not found in Scripture. And Joe, I know as we talk with many of our guests, such as Barry, there's this urgency to talk about Bible prophecy in the church because it often does not happen. I mean, what are some of the things we're hearing as we talk about why prophecy is not talked about in the church today, the importance of it in these last days that we're living in now? There are so many excuses. Let's just use the word excuses mm -hmm. for why we don't talk about it. Well, there are things going on in society. We need to address those. And Christian living is important. And how you live your life as a Christian is important. We deal with watchmen around the world who feel that sense of urgency about sharing the gospel. These are the last days. They compare current events to Bible events and prophecy. So they focus on that. And every week doesn't have to be Bible prophecy, but in your church, you talk a lot about Bible prophecy. Why so much emphasis on Bible prophecy? Well, we're watching it unfold, you know, and I think our job, as uh, Paul said to the church in Ephesus, that we, the purpose of church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I think we have the responsibility, not just to equip them for the ministry, but to create in them a sense of urgency of the shortness of time. And, you know, we at our church, and one of the things that you alluded to was the, the fear of teaching Bible prophecy, the excuses for not teaching Bible prophecy. And a lot of that is from the lack of teaching line upon line, precept upon precept through the scripture, because so much of what we're seeing today is related to the Old Testament. And if you don't have, I mean, there's, there's uh, I forget what the number is, a hundred and some odd 
quotations from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation or allude, allusions to Old Testament scripture. So if you're not teaching the whole book, then you're going to arrive at a book like uh, Ezekiel or a book like the latter chapters of Isaiah or the book of Revelation, and it's going to be confusing because you don't have the foundation in order to understand what's being said. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And we've talked a little bit about the negative aspects going on in our culture today. We want to shift a little bit to the positive, what we as believers can do to make a difference when it comes to living out our faith and incorporating a biblical worldview of prophecy as we move forward and try to share our faith with others. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, first, as we are talking with people about our faith, how do we get people from caring about uh, spirituality in general to caring about what the Bible says about prophecy and how it relates to their lives personally? Well, I think the first thing is what not to do. And I've always looked at Psalm 1 and, you know, it presents the life of the blessed person in the negative first. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the path of sinners or sits in the seat of the scorner. So we're initiated through negative things or things that we are to refrain from in order to have a life that's like a tree planted by rivers of water. And the first thing I think that we should not do is become tactical. You know, 1 John 6, 44 says that no man comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So God has always been using people through the proclamation of the word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, to bring people to himself. So instead of trying to figure out a way to reach more people, we need to stick, as Jeremiah said, to the old path where the good way is, and then you'll find rest for your souls. So absolutely, we should incorporate all types of technology, everything that we have to get the word out quicker and faster and to more people, but the message has to remain the same. It's content and context has to be presented in order to have that uh, someone receive the implanted word, which is able to save their soul. So the first thing is don't get tactical, just stay biblical. And you covered that beautifully. The content is the word of God. That's our sole authority. But the context is so important. Yes. And that's where Bible prophecy comes in. You can't see the daily news now if you know anything about Bible prophecy without being able to point to a chapter and a verse. And uh, wow, it's not just someday something might happen. Right. Ezekiel named the names of the countries and where they're coming from, what direction they're going to attack. I mean, it wasn't just general someday something bad might happen. Yeah. If you have the context, it makes it all make sense. That is so important. And that's what the Bible's all about. The Bible is about specifics and details. You know, if you think about Jesus, that's one of the things I always do when we go to Nazareth in uh, Israel and have a tour group there. You know, just think about the things that Jesus fulfilled. God didn't make it easy for somebody to just pop up and say they're the Messiah. They had to be born of a virgin. They had to be born in Bethlehem. They had to be called out of Egypt, yet they had to be known as a Nazarene. And, you know, that's not something that's just going to happen by coincidence. These, these, just these four little features in and of itself uh, determine that there's going to have to be some supernatural direction in order for this person to be what the Bible said is coming. Well, that's a good way to put it. And and I love the way that you emphasize both the negatives and the positives. As believers, it's easy to get drowned in this negative news, this bad news, this fake news society that we often live in. But there's that good news of the gospel. And when we come back, we want to talk more about that good news, how we could respond like Noah in these last days when we come back on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall comes from I Am a Watchman Ministries, established to help individuals know the love of Jesus, enter into a relationship with Jesus, live for Jesus, tell others about Jesus, and prepare for the imminent return of Jesus. We want to inspire the body to live a life of meaning and purpose. And at the coming judgment, hear the Lord say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. The wise will strive to live well so that they can finish well. The prudent will work to be aware of what God has done and what prophecy notes he will do in the days to come. In support of these goals, the I Am A Watchman ministry is happy to make available at no cost a wealth of discipleship, prophecy, and spiritual growth resources for those who desire to learn and those who are called to lead. Find out more by visiting our website, IamAWatchman.com. That's IamAWatchman.com.
Welcome back to View from the Wall. I'm Dylan Burroughs here with Joe Kerr, and we've been talking with Barry Stagner. This is a wonderful conference here at Hope for Our Times, and we've been blessed to join with both uh, Barry as well as many other experts from around the country on Bible prophecy. As we continue in this last segment, we've been talking about being in a time that is like the days of Noah. There's a negative side to that, but there's a positive side to that as well. And Barry, as we continue our conversation in this segment, tell us some of the positive things from the life of Noah that we can apply in our lives as we look at this passage and how we should respond to it. Well, he didn't let culture influence his calling. You know, he was told by God, here's the dimensions, here's the material list, here's the things you're to do, and this is going to be a prophetic message to the world that judgment is coming and it's looming. So, you know, because he's referred to as a preacher of righteousness, we know what he did while he was building the boat. And it's the same thing that Paul was exhorting Timothy to do in the last chapter of his last letter when he talked about these times coming where sound doctrine won't be put up with. He said, whether it's in or out of season, and I've always looked at that as at least implying whether people like it or not, preach the word. That's the solution. And that's what Noah did. Noah did not allow the basic rejection of what was coming and looming and was evident to him and revealed to him by God to influence how he tried to reach the culture. He kept preaching righteousness. He kept, as Paul said, preaching the word. And that would be the encouragement I would give to believers today. You know, much like we mentioned in the last section, don't become tactical, just stay biblical and continue to proclaim the message, whether it's received or not. And because of the fact that you know, if we look at Noah in that situation and use it um, as kind of a, a barometer, so to speak, as to how bad culture is going to become, uh, Ken Ham has done some wonderful work and had some mathematicians calculate via the lifespan of the uh, antediluvian period, the period of Noah, and, you know, because of the near genetic perfection, he calculated that there were like 16.9 billion people on the earth at the time of the flood. You know, because if you look at the comparison between society then and society now, out of those potentially 16.9 billion people, eight people got on the boat. And that's what the Lord is saying is going to happen in the last days. There'll be relatively few who are actually heeding the word of God and wanting to, you know, be lifted above God's wrath that's going to be poured out on the world. So, but again, we just stay the course. We continue to preach the word. That is an excellent point. And as preachers, and we share that in common background, a pastor, a preacher, a watchman, they all want to see a positive impact made by what they say. I preach the gospel. I want people to respond. When I share the gospel with teenagers, when I was a youth pastor, I want to see something change in their world. I want to see their life improved. I want to see something happen. Noah preached for how many years? 120 years. Yeah, 120 years. And other than his family, zero converts. Right. We have watchmen who know what Bible prophecy says. They watch what's happening in the world. They faithfully share and witness, but it doesn't always go the way we'd like it to. Talk to those watchmen and just give them a word of encouragement and a, a challenge? How, how do they keep going in the face of the world that doesn't want to hear? I think we have to remember our calling, first of all. I like to put it like this. We're called to sow, not succeed. Oh, that's you good. Know, God is in charge of adding to the church daily those being saved. The responsibility he gave to us is to scatter seed. And Jesus in the parable of the soils is talking about the fact that there'll be different levels of receptivity. You know, some, you'll see a response initially but then when the rubber meets the road and Christianity begins to manifest itself for what it really is, then, you know, though they sprouted up, you know, because of the persecution of the word, they fall away or shrivel up. And you have the stony ground where people are just unreceptive. So, you know, we're having all of these things, you know, that we're going to have as experiences when we go out there and try and throw the seeds out. But I think if we just remind ourselves that that is the end of our responsibility, is to just preach the gospel, throw the seed out, let God do what he's going to do. He works in the hearts of those that he's drawing to themselves. And if we relieve ourselves of the end result and just simply remember that God is the one who's doing the work, 
you know, like Paul put it, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, and somebody else reaped. So if we relieve ourselves of the pressure of having to succeed and just sow seed, then we'll find ourselves, I think, relieved a bit from the responsibility that's really not ours. Yeah, that's a great encouragement to those who are listening today and to us personally as well. And I know for many of you listening, you've gone through those difficult experiences with your own family members, maybe with your own co-workers, with those who are close to you, that you see their non-responsiveness to the gospel and to living a godly life. And it's been a challenge for you. So I want you to take these words to heart and, and be encouraged by them today. As we wrap up our last couple minutes, I know people want to know more about your ministry and where they can get more resources from you. Where can they go to find out more about uh, all that you have? to offer? Well, we have a website. It's calvarychapeltustin.org, and that's our church website. I have my own website, barrystagner.com, and uh, my books are available there. On the church website, all the different teachings are available there. If someone would like to uh, download an MP3 or, you know, buy a DVD set, our old, uh, we do a prophecy conference every year at our church called Proximity, and there's past conferences uh, that are available there, too, with some wonderful speakers from around the world and uh, they can access those resources as well. Well, that's wonderful, and it just reminds me so much of God's Word where it talks about keeping the faith, uh, fighting until the end, just like the Apostle Paul did up to his dying breath, that he was committed to sharing Christ, to living out the gospel in his daily life, despite the persecution, despite whether it was successful or not, enduring faithfully to the end. And this has been a good reminder that uh, just like in the days of Noah, we face dark times, but just as in the day of Noah, we have God's power within us to strengthen us through anything that we may face. So thank you for being here with us at a view from the wall and we appreciate your support and prayers we do want to encourage you to check us out at iamawatchman.com where you can find out more about this program how to get some of the resources we've talked about and to connect with us more on social media and we also wanted to let you know that you can contact us anytime so we can pray for you and your request you can go to our website at iamawatchman.com and communicate with us via live chat or send us an email with more details on how we can help you personally to grow in your walk with christ during these last days thank you for joining us Look forward to joining you next time on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening, and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.